welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from pastors here at the Rock. Stand as we pray together tonight. And let's go before the Lord as we always do. Get on my knees. Father God, we're so grateful to you in this house that we get to share with you and we get to hear from you. Father, we get to worship you. And tonight, I want you to continue doing what you've already started, that you speak to our hearts through your word, Father. You can use anybody, anybody. I mean, you can use that jackass, Lord, and you did in the word of God, so you can certainly use me tonight, Father. And I, and I believe that and I pray for that this hour that we open our hearts to hear from you. Holy Spirit, you're the teacher, the master, that, the one who teaches our hearts. Tonight, do that, Lord, that you would teach us. Father, your word is never the problem. It's a perfect seed. It's always the ground, our hearts. So we prepare our hearts to hear from you. May be good within us. Lord, as you bless us in this church, we ask that you would bless those churches that are around the Inland Empire and in the world. Lord, as long as they're teaching the truth of God, we believe that you would bless them and advance your kingdom. We're not better than any of them, but we're co laborers with them, advancing your kingdom and yours alone this very hour and day we declare. In Jesus' name we pray. We all say? Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Go to 2 Kings, and you can mark your Bibles there. We're going to hang out most of the night there. 2 Kings, the Old Testament. 2 Kings chapter 4. 2 Kings chapter 4, and just to put a title, to be honest, I was trying to come up with something clever. I told my wife, I don't have anything clever, but this is the only thing that I feel in my heart that makes sense, which is God's recipe, God's recipe. And uh, it's so important for us to look at that. I know kind of everybody looks a little different, but let me just tell you, not a story, but a reality. I didn't know what a recipe was until I came to the United States of America. It's a lot more common. If you have a Latino or Latin grandma, you have never, ever seen a recipe card in that kitchen, have you? She tells you, throw two tomatillos in, put some salt, blend it together, forget that. You know, it's just how it is. And a lot of people have cooked their entire life in this way. But, but recipes are important because the idea of the recipe is that you put certain elements together because you want a result that looks the same every time you do it. And, and that idea is very important. Even though God doesn't do it the same way every time, he, the result of what he wants is always the same, which is your blessing, your victory, you as an overcomer. And it's so important that you and I look at that because God has a mix. God has some elements that he wants to bring into our lives for us to be successful. And this story has them all. This story so describes what we're talking about. Let's go there. Second Kings chapter 4. Elisha is now the prophet in the land. Elijah has gone to be with the Lord. And Elisha is doing miracles, I mean, left and right, just the power of God backing it up. So he has already um, re re resurrected the Shunammite woman's son, and this is where we take him after he's performed that miracle. Verse 38, chapter 4, 2 Kings says, And Elisha returned to Gilgal, and there was a famine in the land. Now the sons of the prophets were sitting before him, and he said to his servant, Put on a large pot and boil stew for the sons of the prophet. Verse 39. So one went out into the field and gathered herbs and found a wild vine. And gathered from a lab full of wild gourds. And so he had all these vegetables and different things together. And came and sliced them into the pot of stew. Though they did not know what they were. We'll go back to that in a minute. Verse 40 says, then they served it to the men to eat. Now it happened as they were eating the stew that they cried out and said, Men of God, there's death in the pot, meaning there was poison in it, and they could not eat it. So he said, talking about Elisha, he said, So bring some flour. And he put it into the pot, and he said, and said, Serve it to the people that they may eat. And there was nothing harmful in the pot. If you read chapters 2 to chapter 6, I mean, the amount of miracles and things happening are very, very interesting. There's so much happening. But when I read this story, I read this story actually in my personal time, devotion, personal time with God about two months ago, more or less a month and a half ago. And it still spoke to me because there's a similar miracle we'll look at later in chapter 2. But I just saw God working something out that is very interesting. And then... I saw how God creates out of something that looks so complicated, a very simple recipe for you and I in our daily living. When we're stuck in a trouble, when there's something you're about to consume that can be poisoned for you, God has a solution for it. 
And it's so important for us to see that, that we're daily, we're consuming something. And I'm not talking about physical, necessarily physical consumption of food. I'm talking about what you bring in your life, the decisions you make, uh, the people you relate and connect with. Those things can be toxic if they're not the right mixture in your life. And God in this story has a plan, an idea uh, for us to follow. Let's begin there. Recipe for my daily living. Recipe for my daily living. Number one, make God the priority in your life. So simple. I mean, it's just, there, there's nothing to it. How many times have you heard that phrase in this church? You can't even count it, right? Because it's so crucial for us to make God a priority in our, di- in our, in our daily life as we, rec- as we acknowledge Him, as we get it together. It's so important. You know why? Because whatever you give the most time to, that becomes your priority. Do you hear what I said? Whatever you give the most time to, that becomes your priority, whether you like it or not. Now, I'm kind of preaching to the choir because you're here tonight, but it's so important that we always, even those watching online, that you see that Hey, whatever you're giving time to, you're saying this becomes a priority in our lives. And God needs to be part of that, if not the first thing. Look at this. 2 Kings 4.38 starts breaking it down for us. It says, and Elisha returned to Gilgal. So he did a great miracle, went back to his town. And there was a famine in the land. Do you know what a famine is? Famine is no food, very little food. If you've lived long enough, you've seen famines in Parts of Africa, Ethiopia is probably one of the most known one where people are just literally dying left and right because there's nothing, absolutely nothing to eat. That's where they're at. Now notice this. It says there was a famine in the land. And then it says, now the sons of the prophet were sitting before him. Sons of the prophet is an expression that the Old Testament uses a lot because they were uh, people, let's say student, let's say Bible college students of the prophecy. They follow the man of God. They learn from him. They were discipled by him. They learned how to do prophecy, hear the voice of God. But Elisha was the prophet in the land, and these were his followers, his disciples, so to speak. So they were there. They were with him in a time of difficulty. And he said to his servant, put on a large pot. And boils stew for the sons of the prophet. For who was the stew? Sons of the prophet. And it's so interesting because this is very important. Let me just tell you this. I cannot protect you from the problems of the world. It doesn't say there. There was a famine in the land and the sons of the prophet were having a buffet. They were going through the hard time just like everyone else. And so a lot of times we get upset with God. God, why am I going through this? Why is this so hard? And, you know, I'm following you and I'm doing everything. I, I've been in that position. I've been in that position before where I blame God for something because I was serving him when God was explaining to me, hey, listen, it has nothing to do with the trouble. It has everything to do with how you respond in the situation that you're in. By placing God once again as a priority in your life and saying, that's what I want. I told you guys this story. It happened many years ago. I have a friend um, named Nasser. Many of you guys know. And I remember this is probably 06, 05, more or less 05. Um, he, um, his wife had an accident in Yucaipa, a really bad accident. She went off a cliff behind Yucaipa High School. And so I lived really close there. So he called me. We used to work in the same ministry together. He called me and said, hey, I just found out Favina had an accident. It's right by your house. Would you mind checking? So I get in my car with my friend Durbin. And so we drive. When we're arriving, the ambulance already there, everything, the fire department. And I'm thinking, well, this looks worse than I thought. I mean, it's off a cliff, so we get out of the car. Nasser's just arriving as we get there. I look over the cliff, and the car had rolled down, I would say easily 50 feet, all the way down in the ravine. It was upside down. In my heart, in my head, I just thought, you know what? I don't think they're going to pull somebody alive from this thing. That, I mean, that's what I was thinking. But Nasser was so interesting, and the guy is a great guy of faith, um, and he was just praying and praying and praying. And so, you know, she comes up. She, she looks beat up but she doesn't look as bad as i thought she would look so i tell nasser he saw shaking you know the adrenaline you see your wife in an accident i said let me drive you i'll drive the car we'll go right behind the ambulance so i jumped in his car i'm driving and the whole time he's praying he's saying the word of god confessing it this is what i thought this is what i thought inside my eyes i'm thinking god this guy serves you this guy's doing everything right why would this happen to him and god's response was check your heart I thought, what? 
what do I have to do with this? It's his wife and it's in trouble. I mean, this is the accident. And God started speaking to me that here's what I thought. If my wife would have been in that position, I would have not responded like he did. And I made a change that moment, summer 2005. I said, I will go after God until my heart is okay with whatever he does, with whatever he does. And it's so important. The end of the story is they go to the hospital, and just as we expected, because this guy's a tremendous faith, um, they did x-rays in her entire body, an MRI, and all she had was a bruise on one leg. That's it. And so everybody was just like, I have no idea how that happened, but it happened. It was a tremendous miracle. But for me, that story really reveals a, a, a pursuit that I brought in my God, and I said, God, I've served you. You know, I've been in church all my life, but somehow I had allowed God to be a plan in my life, but not the plan in my life. And that's a, that's a complete different thing. You can have God involved in your life, or you can make God the center of your life. And that is the challenge of the Christian walk, including what we're going through in our cultural pressures to do all these other things, including uh, Halloween, whether you decorate or not, or where you do these things. Where, where is God in the center of your life? You have to look at those things and use, and use wisdom in your life. And we'll go to that in a minute. But here's a few verses that I love that um, God showed me. Psalm 37, 18 and 19 in the New Living Translation. New Living Translation, Psalm 37. I recommend it for you. It's a phenomenal psalm. Psalm 37 says, day by day, the Lord takes care of the innocent. That, that's you and I. If we're connected to God, those forgiven, take care of the innocent. And they will receive an inheritance, that's an inheritance that lasts forever. Day by what? day. It's a daily invitation that you ask God to be part of your life day by day. Here's the next verse. Verse 19 says, they will not be, look at this, disgraced in hard times, even in what? In famine. Another version says, they will not be shamed because that is the greatest. Let me tell you, that is the greatest, not risk, but feel that we feel that if we trust God fully, that somehow something's going to shame me. Somehow he's going to do something and I won't be able to own it. I won't be able to save face. I won't be able to, man, I stepped out in faith and I was shamed. He's saying, I will never shame you, even in times of difficulty. That's not God's desire. And they will have more than what? More than enough. More than enough. Even in times of difficulty, God is saying, you will have more than enough. If you make me my priority, then if you make him his priority. And look at this. Jump to 25. There's a famous verse. We all know it. He says, David says, I have been young and now I'm old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken nor his descendants begging bread. David said, listen, I was a young man. I was worshiping God, taking care of sheep. God gave me a great call. I lived the life. I fought the wars. I was a king of a great nation. I was young and old. And in all that time, never saw somebody go after God and God not backing them up. So the decision is yours. It is our decision to say, God, I'm going after you. It was my decision that day to, to decide, am I going to stay on the margin of Christianity? Am I going to be a good guy? Am I going to be somebody who believes in God and, and sees and, and goes to church? Am I just going to stay on the margin of Christianity? Or am I going to go all out for God and say, whatever you want, whenever you want it, regardless of what happens? And that makes a complete difference. That, I mean, I cannot explain it for you. I know that day my life changed. I know that day destiny was opened for me. I know that day something new was brought to birth. Something came forth out of me that day when I said, God, I'm going to pursue you regardless. Even if you don't ever give me anything, even if you don't ever uh, get, do something great, I'm going to pursue you because this is not about what I get out of you. It's the fact that you're it and there's no other plan B. There's no other plan B. And these guys said, you know what? I'm going to stick with the men of God in a time of difficulty. And you and I need to do that. We need to work hard at just coming closer to God. Because times and difficulties are going to come. Let me just, I was thinking about the other day about this. You know the parable, right? So God is talking to you saying, hey, if you do the things that I tell you, it would be like a man who builds his house on a rock, and so that happens, and if you don't do it, it'll be... Now, here's what's interesting. Who, the problems came against what house, or what house? 
both of them. That's right, both of them. Both houses were attacked by problems. Not one, but only one collapse. That one that did not dig deep, that did not set the foundation on the rock, that did not do what it had to do to stand firm in the times of difficulty. And going after God is the fact that you're digging. Every time you come to church, you're digging. Every time you stand in faith, you're digging. Every time something difficulty and you go to God, you're digging. That's all you're doing. So keep at it until you hit rock. When it goes king, king, you're good. Start building. Recipe for my daily living. Number one, make God your priority. Number two, add godly wisdom. Add it to your life. And Pastor Jim talked about this greatly, talking to the man in business. And this is so important. You know why? Because I've met many Christians who are not wise. The fact that you're a Christian doesn't automatically make you a smart person or a person of wisdom. Not smart. This is not about intelligence. This is a person of wisdom. Now, we can gain wisdom because the Bible says we have the mind of Christ. And that's a beautiful thing, that you and I have that access, that no one else does. Look what happens here. 2 Kings 39, 40 says, So one went out into the field and gathered herbs and found a wild vine and gathered from it a lap full of wild birds and came and sliced them into the pot of stew, though they did not know what they were. Can I be honest with you? There's things in your life that you do they're done out of innocence. You don't even know. You don't even know. But because you don't know, you might be getting into something you're not supposed to be part of. Look at the next verse. It says, verse 40 says, Then they served it to the man to eat. So, so let me get it for you. This guy doesn't even know what he's doing. And then he hands it to other people. Are you following the story? So he didn't know what it was, and then he cooked it and served it. Keeps going, said, now it happened. As they were eating the stew, they cried out and said, man of God, there is death in the pot. There's poison in the pot, and they could not eat it. So here's a time of famine. Here's, these people are hungry as all get out. They could only find wild vegetables in the ground, and they chopped it up and boiled it in water. Let's eat something. But what they gathered wasn't good enough because they didn't know what they were gathering. How many of you have made an honest mistake in your life, but your mistake has brought so many other people into it? And, and, and this is exactly why we need wisdom. Because you can make decisions in your life that are going to drag other people right into the situation. Even if it's out of innocence, even if it's out of lack of understanding, God wants you to grow in wisdom so that you don't do this, so that you don't go out to the field, cut the wrong thing, cook the wrong thing, and serve it to others. And the same goes in every decision of our life. What we do, our behavior, how we treat our wives and children, those things affect other people. How we behave and do as an employee is so important because my lack of wisdom can lead others to failure. My lack of wisdom can lead others to failures. Here's uh, 1 Corinthians 1. Go there. 1 Corinthians 1. And uh, um, I'll read a couple verses, and then I'll read one that was we'll we'll shared in our activity. It was so good. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Now, the Apostle Paul is all talking about wisdom in 1 Corinthians. Read it at home. It's a brilliant chapter um, that, where he explains all these things about the wisdom of God. And it, it's phenomenal. So, but I cannot read the entire chapter, so I'm going to read a few verses. So the Apostle Paul is just explaining how the Jews are wanting a sign and the Greeks are seeking a sign or something to do in order to believe in God. So he goes, verse 19, verse 18 says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of what? Of God. And so for you and I, listen, 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 people are going to look at you. People are going to look at you and say, why are you believing that stuff? That's, that's foolish. That's crazy. Why are you standing in faith when that looks contrary to what God can do in you? Don't listen to that. You have to stay focused. Paul is saying, people that look at you, they think your faith is foolish. Uh-uh. It is the power of God to do something great in your life and in your heart. And you have to see it that way that it has a power to do something great. Otherwise, you'll dismiss it. Otherwise, you'll go with whatever everyone says. And Paul says something so amazing. He keeps going. Verse 19 says, For it is written, this is written in the book of Isaiah. Paul says, For it is written, I will destroy, talking about God himself, and saying, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. That says, God is superior to all that. Let me tell you why. You know what Corinth was? 
You know where Athens is? That's where the Olympics came from. Corinth, all the people that we know that were great philosophers in history came out of there. So these guys are drunk in we know better how to do life. And Paul writes a letter and says, you know nothing, man. You know nothing. Paul says, you don't know. Verse 25, this is what Paul says. Look at it. It says, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. And the reason why we need to get godly wisdom is because you and I sometimes live life without inviting the wisdom of God into our life. And the decisions we're making are poisoning the things in our lives that are supposed to have life and goodness for us. And we have to change our perception. And it's so important. Here's what Paul says. Paul says, listen, when God decides to be the foolishness of God, when God is not even making an effort, it's greater than any man. It's greater than any concept you can think of. It's greater than any bank advisor. It's greater than any professor of any college. It's greater than uh, anybody. It's greater than any scientist out of MIT or any school in America or anywhere in the world. It's greater than any of that, his foolishness. And his strength greater than any man. I'm laughing so hard. I have three kids. My little girl, she's Six years old and uh, five years old, she likes to fight. She has two older boys, so that's all she knows. She dresses in pink, but then she fights. It's phenomenal. Uh, and so she's really, you know, she just, that's all she has. That's all she knows, you know, and she is really rough. So I sit in the couch sometimes, and I'm sitting with my wife or whatever, watching TV or a game, and she comes, and she's wanting to fight, so she grabs my leg. Now, li- obviously, I'm a huge guy, and so in comparison to her <laughs> is nothing and in my, not even paying attention to her, just watching TV, she's wrestling with my leg, and I'm making no effort to defeat her. Are you with me? Just the weight of my leg, the length of my leg, can control, she sits on it, I do the swing, all that. The same way Paul is saying, it doesn't matter how strong you think you are, you look foolish holding onto God's leg while he's going, what are you trying to do, man? What are you trying to do? <laughs> it's so, uh, and so... When we don't apply God's wisdom, that's what we look. We look foolish in this process. Look at Proverbs in the Amplified Bible, 4-7. I like it. How is this? In Proverbs 4-7 says, The beginning of wisdom is, he said, get wisdom. With everything you got in your version, says, get wisdom. It says, get wisdom. And then it describes it for It's skillful and godly wisdom. For skillful and godly wisdom is the principal thing. There's the main thing in life that you go to God and you ask him, God, what do I need to do? What decisions do I make? What steps do I need to take? Sometimes, uh, you know, my wife and I, it's so interesting because as a man, men know, we just want to make a decision. Yes or no? You're lying. I'm going to have an altar call later. Oh, you'll have to come for it. We all, we all want a decision. Uh, my wife always challenges me. She says, no, let's pray about it and let's hear from God. And sometimes I'm like, man, I don't want to do that. I, I want to make a decision and that's it. Move on. But there's such wisdom in that because we've said to God, number one, that he's the first thing in our life. That he's a priority. So then we're saying to God, I want to hear what you have to say for my life. And based on that, it says, look, look what opens up for you. And with all you have gotten, everything you can get in life, everything you can go for says get understanding. And then it breaks it down for us. What is understanding? Discernment, comprehension, and interpretation. Listen up. Listen up. Listen up. Those of you who are thinking, Pastor, that makes no sense to me. I didn't go to school. I'm not a college-educated person. How does that do? Doesn't the Bible say that God uses the foolish of the earth to confound the wise? God is not looking for your degree. God is looking for your availability. That's all he's looking for. Are you saying, he's saying, God, I'm available. Use me. I'm available. Tell me what to do, and I will follow through on it. I, I want to get your wisdom. And sometimes the Bible is so full of wisdom, and we ignore it. I was talking to a person one day who said, Pastor, you know, I want to help somebody out. And so I went. It's such a great testimony because that person was in need, and I went and co-signed their car. And I said, you're dumb. What do you mean, Pastor? I'm helping somebody. Proverbs says, if you co-sign for somebody, do whatever you got to do and get out of it. Hope didn't offend you. Then read the Bible because it's there. <laughs> when I read that verse, I've always said from there on my office, and I said, I'm going to help you in a different way. If I can give you the money, I'll give you the money. If I can speak on your behalf, I will. I ain't signing that paper because godly wisdom told me in Proverbs, don't do it. 
Simple step. And so sometimes we wonder, why am I in such trouble, God? What's going on? Get wisdom. And then apply it. And then apply it. Then put it to work. Then put it in your life. It's so important. I hope I'm not offending you, but I hope I'm pushing you in certain areas in your life to do what God is asking you to do. Because that's what he wants from us. I mean, I, when I found these principles, when we're talking, we're teaching our series on finances and the word of God, I, 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 re, I was reading all these principles, thinking to myself, man, God, I've made so many mistakes in my life, and it was all written here all along. All along was right here telling me what to do and when to do it. And God is inviting you to say, get wisdom, get wisdom. A wise man, heard this phrase in love, that a wise man learns by experience of others. An ordinary man learns by his own experience. A fool learns from nobody. <laughs> That's pretty straightforward. Number three, and last one for today. Can you handle one more? Yeah. Number one, you make God your priority. Number two, get wisdom. Number three, and very simple, very simple. I told you that it was simple. Apply to your life. You have to apply this thing daily to your life. Apply God's recipe for your life. You have to apply it. You have to do it. Let me just tell you this much. Just because you have a bunch of cookbooks in your house does not make you a great cook. <laughs> have you found that out? Okay, good. I'm glad we're on the same page then. It doesn't make you. So many of us have all these things available to us, but just because we have it doesn't mean we're smart or wise. We actually have to apply it, try it, make it, and then all of a sudden we get into this group of doing the things the ways of God. Look at this. Now, 2 Kings 4.41 says, so he said, so he said, talking about Elisha, so he said, then bring me some flour. And he put it into the pot, and he said, serve it to the people that they may eat. And there was nothing harmful in the pot. That's an amazing thing. Elisha goes, hey, I know there's death, there's poison. Wait, wait, give me some flour. Puts it in the pot and says, serve it to the people. I would pay money to see the face of the first guy who got that bowl. Here you go, man. Uh, somebody was dying just two seconds ago, so someone else try this one out, you know? Um, because Elisha did something so brilliant, and this is the word. If, if you don't get anything tonight, I want you to get the next five minutes of what I'm going to share with you. If you don't get anything else tonight. God did not throw away the stew. He transformed the stew. And you and I are caught in situations in life where we need to ask God, Lord, where's my flower? What's going to change where I'm at? God is not telling you throw away the stew. He is wanting you to press in to get the thing that's going to change what's harmful in your situation this very moment, this very hour. As a matter of fact, he, he does the same miracle in chapter 2. And it's even uh, so amazing because of what people said. And I want to read it to you. Go to chapter 2 of 2 Kings, right there, chapter 2, 2 Kings, verse 19, verse 19, he says, then this man of the city, Elisha comes in, and there's a men of the city, some uh, governors, probably people that were leaders of the city, come out to meet him and said to Elisha, Elisha, please notice, say, please notice. please notice. That means pay attention to the following. Please notice, the situation in this city is what? Pleasant. Another version says, the city is good. These guys say, take notice, prophet, that the situation in the city is pleasant. As my Lord sees, you can see with your own eyes that everything around you looks great. But the water is bad and the ground is barren. And, and when I read that, I, 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 pray, I was praying for marriages and praying for my own marriage and praying for the city. And, and you know what? San Bernardino is the same way. We'll look around and say, God, the city is good. There's good people here. You can do something great. And all we see is dryness and barrenness and things that are bad. How about your marriage? You're saying, God, this is a good man. This is a good woman. But there's difficulty. There's, there's poison in it. God, I love my job. But, you know, even though I love my job, there's poison in it. How about if we ask God to transform it? How? Look at this. And he said, talking about Elisha, bring me a bowl and put in it salt so that it brought it to him. Then he went out to the source of the water. Oh, I love that. He went out to the source of the water. You have to go to the source of your problem and ask God to transform it. 
And what we're being trained to do is just grab the problem and move on. This guy went bad, I'm divorcing and moving on to the next one. Or girl, this job is awful, I'm putting in my two weeks and moving on to my next job. And we spend the rest of our lives from job to job to job when the one job could have been just as phenomenal for you. You don't have to clap if you don't feel like it. It's okay. It's not, it's not a good point. I'm not asking you to clap. It's not, it's not fun. It's not fun to realize that. I lived it in my own life. I lived it in my own life. When I was in Las Vegas, I had a job, had a great job, but I wanted more money. And I kept at it. I wanted more money, more money. Finally, they didn't give me the race I want. I said, forget you, man. I know I'm qualified for it. I know I can do a better job. I went to a different company. I might as well have been working for the devil himself. This place was absolutely atrocious. I mean, it was probably the worst job I had in my life. It was so horrible. I'm, I'm not kidding you. So horrible. I mean, the guy got sued. The office was closed down. It was absolutely horrible. I went back. I remember I was praying, God, give me a solution. And God said, go back to your other job and beg for mercy. I was like, oh, I ain't doing that. <laughs> That's embarrassing. I wasn't you, Jesus. You don't embarrass us. But he said, then he went out to the source of the water. Go back to your situation and cast a salt. And look at this. It says, thus says the Lord, I have healed this water. From there shall be no more death or barrenness. So the water remained healed to this day according to the word of Elisha, which he spoke. God spoke a word, gave Elisha an idea. He applied it, and he had the solution. In the same manner, I went to God, and God said, go back to your other job. My wife is a witness to this. I went back to my other job, and uh, I said, I told, talked to my manager. I said, man, I'm, I'm so sorry. I'll come back. I'll take the same pay I had before. I, I just want to come back. I feel I need to come back. I'll serve you guys. And, and she said, okay. She said, no, we're not going to pay you that. We'll give you one more dollar than we were giving you before. I think you're worth it. You know? and, and so, so I come on. Man, I was working as hard as I could. Zero complaints. I was just doing it because God has shown me that the problem wasn't in the job necessarily. The problem was in my behavior, my understanding. Watch this. Watch this. Within six months, I was a supervisor of an office, and I had a $3 pay raise in six months. And that was a big deal for me back then. So the problem was never the job. God somehow find a way to bless me in a situation that before I thought, this is horrible. I don't want to be part of this. And God is saying, I can do miracles in the situation because just like the people say, the city, take notice, the city is wonderful, but there's a few issues within it. My, my family is wonderful. I love them, but we have a few problems. My job is great, but there's a few problems in it. My body, I, I'm, it's great, but I have health issues. So here's the word of God for you. Where's your flour and where's your salt? Where's your flour and where's your salt? And the challenge for us tonight is that ask God, where's the flour and where's the salt for my situation? That God may change it. Look at this. In all time, in a time of famine, Elisha did not throw away the stew, did not dry up the waters. He fixed what was once harmful so that it may be a blessing in your life. And that is exactly what the Lord is trying to do for you and speak to us tonight. I don't know in what situation you're in, but the word of God is this. Whatever you're in, there's some flour and salt to change where you're standing right now in the moment you're in life. And we have to go to God and say, God, I need that. I need to get the flour. I need that salt. And tonight as we end, I want to give you that moment. In a moment, I'm going to ask Elijah, he'll play, and I just felt God wanted us to. I don't want you to walk out of here without getting an answer from God tonight in your heart. That tonight you say, God, I'm opening my heart, I'm opening my ears. And I'll repeat the three things that were simple but important. Daily recipe for living. Make God your priority. Every day, acknowledge him. Make him your priority. Number two, number two, get wisdom. Find a way to understand his word, to grow, to hear good counsel. You know when Pastor Jim and Deborah say, listen to grandpa and grandma every time they're here? They're speaking wisdom to us. They're not just saying words. They're telling you, I've lived this, and I want you to hear what I have to say to you. And that is a reality for many of us. We, we probably didn't have somebody tell us that. So listen to wisdom. Get humble in your heart and listen to it. And thirdly, apply what God is telling you to apply because that's the secret. Once again, you can have all the cookbooks in the world, but if you don't do what is in it, you'll never get the result out of it. 
and God is speaking to you tonight in that regards. Tonight, just right where you're at, start asking God, God, I have this situation in my life. I need to get the flour. I need to get the salt. I have this situation in my life, and I, I need you to speak to me this hour, this moment. Right now, just keep telling him. Say, God, talk to me. I'll repeat verse 41 of 2 Kings says, that once they put the flour, says, and there was nothing harmful in the pot. There'll be nothing harmful in your path, in your life, in your family, in your job, if you bring it to God right now. God, speak to us. Speak to us. God, I speak and declare as we all tonight are opening our ears to you, Lord, that you will speak to us, Lord. And I, I speak and declare tonight that we'll have the faith to move forward in whatever you tell us because there will be nothing harmful in what you give us this hour, this day, for this situation in our life, Lord. I believe it, and I declare over all of us tonight that we have the faith to move forward. Lord, we declare, we say tonight from our lips that we make you a priority. We want to hear from you, and we want to do what you're asking us to do so there will be nothing harmful in our lives from this moment forward. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And amen. Give a hand to the Lord. God spoke to you tonight. I want to make sure your heart is okay with God. And many have left. And I'm going to ask you if you remain seated. It will be a blessing to others so that people that do need to hear this and should hear this and will stay in their seats and pay attention to what God is saying. Here's what we talked about. It's so interesting. Here's what we talked about tonight. We talked about making God your priority, making God first in your life, and, and then God will do something amazing in your life and remove the things out of your life that are not a blessing to you. But none of that can start, listen, none of that can start until you make God your priority. And if tonight you're sitting there thinking, well, pastor, I am a, a, a person kind of marginal to this. I mean, I, I, I know of a church and, and I've heard of God, but I've never really made God the center of my life. Then tonight is a great opportunity to change that. If you say, Pastor, um, you know, I, I, I've always wondered about heaven or hell, but I think I'm going to go to heaven because, you know, I'm a good guy. I'm a, I'm a good girl. I'm a, a social, decent person. So I don't see um, that God would do that to anybody. Yet nowhere in the word of God is written because you're a social, decent person. You make it into heaven. Or because you have some concept of knowledge of God that you will get into heaven. None of that. None of that. Once again, God has to be the all in all in your life. And that's what we talked about, God being the center of your life. How interesting. You know, some people may say, Pastor, I got you on this one, Pastor. I got you covered. You know why? Because not only do I understand and, and hear about God, but I've been to church and I, I've learned verses from the Word of God. Verses. I know some of them. You know what's amazing? That in the Word of God says, and it shows you that the devil also knows verses. And he is not going to heaven he's not and the word of god says that demon believe and they tremble but they're not making it to heaven either so the decision tonight is not whether you understand church is not whether you know a verse is not whether you've grown up in a christian country therefore we're all christians in america 82 percent of people say they're christians in america and i get the feeling that we may say we're Christian, but we don't have Christ as the center of our lives. So God is asking you to change your position. Here's your position. Pastor, I know about God. Tonight, he wants you to meet him. How do you do that? How do you do that? Listen, God is talking to a guy here in the Bible named Nicodemus. And this guy was brilliant. He knew the word of God. He was a, a leader in his church and the synagogue. I mean, he knew the scriptures. He had to know the scriptures to become a leader. Yet it is to that man. Listen to this. Jesus says, Nicodemus, you must be born again. That word is a funny word. As a matter of fact, born again Christians are always, always, always described as the hokey, kind of geeky guy with the hat and the glasses. And you don't know anything, which is so far from the reality. Because born-again people are lying at heart. They made a decision for God to follow God with all their might, with all their strength, with their focus. And that is a challenge for you tonight. God is saying, listen, make me the center. Make me the center tonight. Nicodemus had that challenge. Jesus said, hey, I'm going to challenge you, Nicodemus. I just don't want you to know about God. Like right here in the head, I want you to have him right here in your heart. And that's really the center of this conversation. Jesus says the following. He says, when I come... 
and will believe his coming. I better find you hot or cold. Because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. Those are graphic, strong words. You know what he's saying? He's saying, don't play with me. You're either in or you're out. But don't play with me. And, and God is inviting you. See, because God is a center God. God is a just God. God is a God who says, listen, I was in a shame to go send my son to a cross. I died publicly for you because I love you. But now I'm going to ask something in return. Here's what God is asking in return. In a moment, I'm going to count to three. I'm going to pop my hands or hit my Bible. When you hear that, it is your turn, your moment to raise your hand right where you're at. And when you're raising your hand, you're saying, pastor, I need to ask God to be the center of my life today. I want to take that opportunity. Why do you have to raise your hand? Why, why am I making it public? At least I already told you, Jesus died publicly. He wasn't ashamed. But listen to this. The word of God says, if you acknowledge me before men, I'm a man, I'll see your hand. We'll see your hand. It says, I'll acknowledge you before my father. But in the same verse, in the same verse, listen to this, listen to this. But if you deny me, I will deny you. God is a just God. He's saying, I've done it all for you. All you have to do is trust me today to start this walk. In a moment, I'm going to do that. I'm going to count to three. I'm going to hit my Bible. And when I do that, you raise your hand. Who should raise your hand? Those who are marginal. Those who say, God, uh, Pastor, I, I hear what you're saying, but uh, your description, and I, and I want to do something. Then do it. Do it. God is asking you to do it tonight. You know God spoke to you in your heart. Those who are sitting there, who should raise their hand? Those who did a prayer. Well, I did that prayer, but your life did not follow what you said with your lips. Recommit your life to God today. Who should raise their hand? Those who are sitting right there saying, I've never done that. Then start today. May God, the center of your life, the priority in your life this very day. I'm going to count to three. I'm going to hit this Bible, and you raise your hand. I've done my part. God has done his. Now is your part. If you raise your hand, you're saying, I need God in my life. And then we'll all pray together in a moment. One, two, three. Thank you. Thank you. Three, four. Thank you. Five, six, seven. You can really, eight. Thank you. You can put your hands down. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I saw her. Nine. Thank you. Is there anyone else? I didn't embarrass them. I won't embarrass you, but I want to give you the chance. Nine people say, hey, I'm ready for that. I, I need God tonight. I want to make a change. Thank you. I see that hand. Ten. How wonderful. Ten people are saying, hey, that's me. That's me. Is there anyone else? I'm not trying to embarrass you, but I want to give you a chance. Start today. Why wait? Why wait? Apply it to your life. This is your moment. Is there anyone else in this place? Is there anyone else? This is your moment. I'm waiting because I believe the Spirit is giving a few of you a chance. There's a few of you sitting there. I feel you fighting, saying, ah, should I do this? You know, I, I'm not sure. Do it. Thank you. 11. Is there anyone else here tonight? This is your moment. This is your time. You and God. An encounter with God starting today. Make him the center of your life. I'm going to wait just, just a few more minutes because God is speaking to some of you. Thank you, those who are waiting and patient. Thank you so much. Is there anyone else tonight? Okay, can't make you come, but this is what I'll do. I'll give you one more chance in a minute. Those who raise their hand, here's what we're all going to do. Everybody in this place in a moment, we're all going to stand, and we're going to clap for you because we're excited. We want to be with you in this moment. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to be brave and take one more step. I want you to grab your Bible, your coat, whatever you have. Don't leave anything in your chair. Meet with me right here. We're going to pray together to ask Jesus to come into your heart. If you did not raise your hand, this is your moment to still come and say, I want to do this. Don't stay there. Make a move. So right now, if you raise your hand and those who didn't want to come, this is your moment. Let's all stand and welcome them this very hour. What a great step. Come on. Won't you come just as you are? Oh, and hear the Spirit call. Won't you come just as you are? Don't be embarrassed. Make the move. Thank you. Thank you so much. 
If you want somebody to come with you, just tell them, hey, come with me. I, I, I want to do this. Just give your heart to the Lord this hour. This is your moment. Good job, guys. This is your moment. There's still time. Don't miss the opportunity to make God your priority today. This is your moment right now. Thank you. God is good. God is good. Listen, those of you who are here today, this is a good thing. Put a smile on your face. You're starting a new life. God is going to start something new. Because you know what you just said? You said, God, I'm going to make you today the first thing in my life. Nothing else. Nothing. I'm going to make you, I'm going to take you serious. And we want to be part of that journey with you today. As a matter, I have a few minutes. I love doing this. Can we pray with you? We're going to pray together with you. So this entire congregation, we're going to repeat this words with you because we want you to feel that we're right behind you, okay? You're going to repeat some words. They're not magical words. But the words that if you're said with a sincerity of heart, then something new starts that day with you. Let's pray together. Say, Jesus Christ, I invite you into my heart. And I ask forgiveness of my sins. The wrongdoings that I've committed in my life against you. But today, I receive your forgiveness. Receive me as your son and as your daughter. From this moment forward, I'll follow you. I'll make you my priority. Be with me from this moment until the end, because that's your promise. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. How oh, cool. Listen. So here's what's going to happen. In a moment, Pastor Joel is right there. He's my buddy. He's my friend. He's going to do a few things. Let me just tell you so you don't feel that it's, there's nothing weird. What is he going to do? He's going to pray with you. If you need extra prayer, if you need, he's going to cover that. He's going to pray with you. Second, he's going to offer you something so important. He's going to give you something. He's going to give you two books. They're, they're small. They're very simple. One will tell you, welcome to destiny. It'll tell you how you begin this walk, what you're going to do. And the second thing, he's going to do a third thing. He's going to offer you a friend. Imagine that, a friend in church. You need a friend. You know why? Because you're starting new. You want to know what's this about. How am I going to become successful in this walk? He's going to explain that to you. Let us help you do this. Here's something we say at The Rock. If you give the Lord and us a year of your life, by the end of that year, it's going to be completely different and far better than when you started today. That's the truth. That's the truth. So follow Pastor Joel. He'll get you that information in just a few minutes, and then you go with your family. Thank you so much. Thank you. Come on, give him a hand. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son, and that you sent him for me, and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.